Meisner. Breathtaking scenery, world-class golf, fabulous restaurants, oysters. Not really the things petrolheads care about, but luckily for us then, that Samola offers all of this, plus the perfect location for the Jaguar Samola hill climb. It's incredible how a simple stretch of tar can really get a man's heart racing. We all have our special road, that curving, twisty run, where we live out our boyhood racing dreams. In the picturesque town of Neisner, there is a very special stretch of top. Legendary, in fact. A 1.9 kilometer climb up to the Samola Hotel, Country Club and Spa. It hasn't been on the calendar for a while, but for 120 committed drivers, the best news is the Jaguar Samoa Hill Climb is back. A 50 second run where they put everything on the line. Regular visitors to Samoa won't recognize the hill. Such is the transformation. Full pit facilities, hospitality areas, spectator viewpoints, all of this for a three day celebration of man and machine pushing boundaries. Classic Car Friday was a real trip down memory lane. A collection of cars like this is usually only seen statically displayed in a museum somewhere. So to see them in action was a real celebration of motoring for spectators. Some of the cars date back 80 years, so to make competition fair, the 44 competitors were split into five classes. And let me tell you, every car there had a story. Yeah, it's a very special uh, MG built by Les Miller in 1950. The MG is called M uh, Spider, and uh, Les has had some serious uh, wins in this, I think six national wins in this car. Uh, he holds the uh, Berman Drive hill climb record uh, in 1952. Uh, I've raced the car for the last 24 years. No, this is the real deal. This is the car that, uh, this was an original uh, Works Gunston car that came out with a Chevron factory and Paul Owen, driven by Mark Halewood and Brian Redman, Paddy Driver, and they actually won the Springbok Series, which was part of the World Series in those days in the, seven, in the early 70s. Now for some, it wasn't all about speed and top honours in class. No, not, not so good, but I think it's the fastest 10 seater here today. <laughs> Here we see Brian Bruce and his Ford Model A Speedster completing the climb in a time of 149.3. Snail pace by today's standards, but lightning fast 80 years ago. But there were some really rapid cars up the hill. Then Franco Scribanti in his Chevron B19, flying up the hill in a new hill climb record of a 42.246. Amazing. We shocked ourselves, our, our fastest old cars. I mean, it's 1970s and the fastest lap ever. I mean, we by this afternoon we figured we we're going to win if nothing went wrong, but to 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 to, to get the lap record, that's like it's blown us away. Yes, yeah. those big Nissan monsters have got something to think about now. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't actually know what to say. I'm quite blown away the lap record on this old car. So Franco took top honours in Class H5 as well as winning the classic Conqueror title. Oh, what a glorious sight. After heavy overnight rain, sunshine on a Saturday morning was a welcome sight for the 80 King of the Hill competitors. For cars and drivers and fans alike, the two-year wait was finally over. Now with Classic Car Friday having already rewritten the record books, there was a real buzz around the paddock. This event has always attracted big names in the motor racing family. The format of the event providing a unique challenge for both driver and machine. And what an incredible lineup of cars. From insanely modified weapons to purpose built race cars. And of course, the latest, hottest supercars. All with one objective in mind to cover that twisty stretch of road at Samola as quickly as possible. The driver's briefing was a proverbial calm before the storm, with drivers anxious to get their assault on the hill underway. 
with five practice sessions and seven qualifying runs, easing into the weekend was the sensible way to go especially with conditions being what they were early on. Greasy, with running water in parts, concentration levels were at the maximum from the start. Making it into the top 10 shootout is of course every competitor's goal, but with cars having been grouped into classes according to specification and output, being fastest in class is the first priority. Having 18 classes meant that spectators were treated to a wide variety of cars and times. So whether you were pushing to dip into the 40s or the 50s, every driver was searching for that faster line, that better start, that smoother transition through the twisties. So what makes this event so challenging for a driver? In many ways it's more intense because, you know, if you're on a track, you've got time to make up what you lost. Yeah, there's the, the, you've got one shot and that's it. So you really got to commit you don't want to overcommit because it's all over before you wake up. Multiple national saloon car champion Graham Nathan sums it up perfectly. Yeah, racetrack is one thing where you've got, you've got uh, intimate knowledge and you've studied it and you've got data and you've got all those wonderful things about that you can use. Yeah, it's down to actually raw, raw hang on for dear life and let's see how big the balls get. Planning beforehand is very important because you don't have any time, there's no warm up that week. So you actually have to in the pit lane get yourself ready to go because it's only like under 50 seconds for most cars, it's not very long at all. So in the time that the normal race car driver is warming up and getting his head into gear, you're already back at the back going, what happened? You know? So you have to prepare right here in the pit lane. And it is an incredible rush, an overwhelming adrenaline-filled seat-of-the-pants ride. Get it right, and you react like Edwig Swears. Come on! Yes! That's a 47, come on! Nice! Nice! Get it wrong, and the consequences are dire. No runoff, no margin for error. The risk is intoxicating for spectators. But it is a racing event after all, and drivers are pushing limits. So safety is critical for the organisers. We caught up with Jeff Goddard. Safety is a, a, a huge factor always, and we want to, each event we have, we make it better and better. We've had huge focus this time on fire prevention. We've got new technology in. We've got people that really understand if we had a real fire, we could handle it. So we're quite happy there. And now we also, we're constantly looking at the tyre barriers to improve on them, and we're quite happy going forward. And as the track dried out, time started to plummet. Davi Willefier in the 5 litre supercharged F Type Coupe was lighting up the tyres and the timing sheets, clocking a 47.5. The skylines of Quincy Sale and Dwayne Galloway were neck and neck. A 47.3 and a 47.2 saw them in ninth and eighth position at the end of Saturday. Greg Parton and his Lamborghini Aventador, a crowd favourite and super fast. Malcolm Royston and his Subaru had dipped into the 45s, while Andrew Strike was enjoying his first run out in a Skyline, solid in fifth position with a 45.7. Event favourite Des Goodside had slowly been turning up the wick on his 1,200 horsepower beast, and by the end of Saturday, he was dipping into the 43s. Jackie Schechter finished in third overall the last time this event was held, and he seemed in fine form again with a 43.454, his fastest time on Saturday. Anton Cordia had broken his sequential box on his Subaru and was nursing the shift on a replacement standard STI box. Ending up in second position with a fastest time of 43.450 was a fantastic achievement. 
but the Samoa GTR of Darren Goodmans was the man to beat. The only guy to be under the 43s of 42.994, seeing him top of the timesheets. Then again, Franco and his Chevron hadn't turned a wheel at all on Saturday. After the break, we crown the Jaguar Samoa King of the Hill. Now the locals will tell you that this town really does get four seasons in one day. Well, the good news is the racing gods are certainly shining down on the Jaguar Samoli Hill Climb. Sun is out for day two. Day one started pretty tricky. There'd been heavy rain overnight. Track conditions, very, very wet, very greasy. Uh, and times were kind of way off the pace. But as the afternoon ran on, guys were certainly getting on it. Leading it at the end of day one, Darren Goodmans, Jackie Schecht is up there. Of course, there's good sight is there as well. Anton Cronier is there. What's going to happen today? That is what everyone's come to see. The dark horse, of course, Franco Scribanti and that Chevron. I can't wait to see who is going to be crowned King of the Hill. And I wasn't the only one. Sellout crowds on Saturday and more of the same on Sunday for the finals meant that this year's Jaguar Somali Hill Climb was already a massive success. With plenty of fantastic viewing points along the climb and big screens up on the hill, fans were guaranteed of always being in the thick of the action. As title sponsor, Jaguar had run a media challenge with five of the top motoring scribes vying for top honors in identical Jaguar XFs. The times were tight throughout, but it was Angus Thompson, Jesse Adams and Stuart Grant that were contesting the Class A1 final. With 0.02 separating first and second, bragging rights went to Stuart Grant. Owen Bridges in his tricked out Honda Civic Type R made all the right sounds in third place, but couldn't match the Nissan 200SX of Anton Slubbett in second. Quickest in class, A2, Owen Nordea and his Subaru STI. Some really quick times. Class A3 was a straight Bavarian shootout with Francois Cowley's BMW 325i. No match for the impressive BMW N1 piloted by Edric Swears. Class A4 was all about the Nissan GTRs. Gordon Nicholson had improved nicely over the weekend to finish third, with front-running Quincy Sale and his R34 Skyline absolutely surprised by the violin playing Henry Pinar. Even with some unusual lines, his last run dropped him into the 46s and first in class. Rewarding to drive in damn fast too. Anthony Ashley brought his Lotus 7 home in third place. Arnold Klimke was second in his Lotus 7 replica, but they were no match for Peter Zeely and his tricked out Lotus Exige. With only two competitors in A6, it was a straight shootout between the modified BMW and a standard Porsche GT3, with Ryan Buddha taking class honors from Johan Zilch. I always love speed, always love nice cars. I've been watching some of these boys. Uh, Roger's a legend in my books, a living legend, and it's just so amazing to be part of this. It's absolutely awesome. Class A7 saw our queen of the hill, Tanya Watts, in her Audi RS4, absolutely stoked with third position. Mark Castle and his Ferrari California were secured in second. But nobody could come close to the impressive times Greg Parkman was setting in his Lamborghini Aventador. Class A8 was dominated by the McLarens. Jacques Wheeler had been consistent the whole weekend and found himself in third position. Darby Willefeer was fighting above his weight in the F-Type, a respectable second place for him. And Ernst de Brier got it all right in his last run, setting a time of 46.7. Well, B1 brought some potent Japanese cars to the hill. Rolf Kearns and his Evo 4 finished in third position, with Malcolm Royston not able to match his best time in the final class run, but doing well enough to secure second. But Anton Cronier was untouchable in his class and giving himself a real shout at overall honors in the King of the Hill shootout. But the real insane machinery powering up the hill was to be found in class B2. Chances were pretty solid that the overall winner could come from this class. Top drivers, top times, top step belonging to Darren Goodmans in a blistering time of 41.831. It was a parade lap for Rory Beatty and his Jaguar head office project XJ. With no contest in class, it really was time to please the crowd. 
great day out. First day of the past run here, or first day's run at all. So a great result. And I just saw my last. Well, our last lap was just an exhibition. Show. Yeah, that was exactly just to get Jaguar out there to let them know we're back into racing, um, albeit as a, a more of a team building fun thing. Um, but it's more to get them out there knowing that what these cars can do. Um, and thanks to Castro for what they've done and assisting us to get this off the line. Um, so it's a great day out and a great show for the, for the crowds. Class B4 saw Julian van Rensburg and Johan de Toy flying the flag for VW, but neither could catch the caterum of Tony Ledler. B5 brought some older cars to the hill, but Hermann Berger Skyline was no match for the BMWs. Adam Irwin pushing Graham Grumpy Nathan right to the very end. Ian Schechter was sharing Charles Arton's Ashley V8 Masters car, with Charles pipping Schechter over the line. Some really impressive times. Michael Beachyhead and his Porsche 917 replica were uncontested in class, and let's be honest, uncontested in iconic status on the climb. The battle of the single seaters proved that it wasn't all about displacement, with Ben Pinar in his Formula V and Sway Chabert in his Aerial Atom setting some really fantastic times. But Franco Scribanti's Chevron seemed unstoppable, setting another hill climb record in this class final. Francis Carruthers and his Juno SS3 were at the sharp end of the timing sheets all weekend, a 43.2 safely seeing him into the top 10 shootout. Class C6 was the final class, and Michiel Simons and his Ford GT40 had come on in leaps and bounds, improving by nearly 10 seconds over the course of the weekend. Now with the Somali Hill Climb having taken a break for a year, it only seemed to add to the appeal for both drivers and spectators. We caught up with Ian Shrewsbury. A superb sponsor on board, obviously, and that was the kickstart we needed in, in Jaguar. It's been great to work with, really excited about the event, enthusiastic, all their directors are really behind it. We've had a record entry from competitor point of view, we've had record entry from crowd point of view. Uh, yeah, we've sold more beer than ever before by a long, long way, and uh, yeah, I think from every, every angle it's been a, a huge success and by far the the best event we've ever had. So with class honours already having been decided, it was time to slog it out for the King of the Hill title. The 10 fastest times throughout qualifying was how we got to our final shootout. And with the clean time sheets, it all came down to this final run, being able to stick together that perfect blast up the hill. Malcolm Royston was solid throughout the event. He's 47.5, seeing him good for 10th place. Greg Parton's Lamborghini Aventador had impressed the entire weekend. A 45.048, an incredible time considering this is a standard road car. The only one competing in the top 10. You know, four-wheel drive, way more dynamic, a lot more corner speed, exit speed. You know, it's something to get used to, but uh, I'm hooked on these GTRs. And I'm hooked, I'm hooked. And yes, Andrew Strike had had a brilliant first outing, clearly showing his love for the Skyline. A solid eighth place with a 44.684. He's going to be happy with that. With mechanical issues keeping him out of action for most of Saturday, 2011 winner Van Hallenbach made the best of a really tough weekend, with a 44.493 securing him seventh position. And it was a real big jump up to sixth place. With his sequential box in pieces, Anton Cronier was really hoping that the standard SDR box could handle all the abuse. But with his car so incredibly well set up, he was one of the quickest through the second sector. A 43.140, impressive considering. The Juno SS3 is an impressive piece of racing machinery and it sounds pretty amazing too. But not having the out-and-out -out grunt to out-muscle most of his competitors, Francis Carruthers knew that the second sector was where he would make up the time. The car's racing pedigree coming to the fore. A 42.354 was a big jump up to fifth position. So Jackie Schechter had finished second in class, relegating pre-event favorite Des Goodside to third position. What did he have left in reserve for this final run? Jackie was motoring up the hill, really, really pushing it hard. And by the end of the first sector split, his time of 26.252 was the fastest so far. Well, the Skyline at just on two tons has to shift a lot of weight around when compared to race cars like the Juno and the Chevron. And you can clearly see that through the twisty bits. A 42.105, man, that's an impressive time. Good enough for fourth place this year. Uh, look, it was awesome. Uh, uh, 
we're not quite on the ragged edge yet. I've got a couple of tents and other things happy for the final. But yeah, uh, the whole day we've been trying to get the launch control working on 35. It hasn't worked. So we went back to basics and drove it like a man. So, fastest at the end of Saturday, winning the super competitive B class, could Darren Goodmans end up going one better by lifting the King of the Hill trophy? Well, he was going to have to get to the ragged edge in his Samola skyline to do that. So with all eyes on the timing screens, Darren's 26.215 was just a fraction ahead of Jackie over the first sector split. Was it going to be enough? Oh, a really solid second sector, saw him drop into the 41s. Super consistent Darren with a 41.9, giving him third place overall. You know, as you know, this is the first time out with this motor car. We're shaking it down now, so uh, I think we've got a bit of work to do. Uh, the car's there, the performance is there, the power's there. The car's awesome car to drive, but it is a handful, there's no doubt about it. And we've kept the boost very reasonably down. Uh, we still have quite a lot of horsepower to spare, but we can't use it here, so... Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we're going to cause this event as a shakedown and uh, see where we come and we, we have the, to be in the top 10. Well then, Des Goodside must be well pleased with himself coming into the King of the Hill shootout with the second fastest time. But this is what the crowds had come to see. The ferocious, tar-tearing launch of this wild skyline. Oh, my word, that is just insane. You never tire watching that car launch. But for Des, it was win or lose in this first sector. This was where his horsepower had a clear advantage. And boy, was he shunting. Oh, yes, that's a fantastic time. 25.862, 4 quicker than anyone else. But the question now was, could he hold on to the animal through the sweeps? Oh, Des showing all of his experience, fantastic driving, and what an incredible time, 41.705. Yeah, look, uh, today's the day that counts, yesterday was a bit damp, so we thought we were going to sit it out rather than go through the risk of winning it. Um, yeah, we fast, it's in this section, but it's, it's just, we go faster, one of the GTRs go faster than us, then it listen, so let's see, it's going to be tight, yeah. Well, this is it. Time for Franco Scubanti to step up to the plate. He knows exactly what he needs to do. Just 1.9 kilometer stands between him and the title. Could he put together another perfect run? And the start is so critical. That seemed like a cracker. Frank will be happy with that. He's run off to the perfect start. Now with a 2 litre engine powering the Chevron, it was always going to be outgunned by the more powerful Skylines, but it did have a massive weight advantage. The question, how much was he going to lose to Des in the first sector? Mm, the time there for Franco, 26.337. That's 0.5 down on Des. Could he pull it back? Oh, just take a look at that car and driver showing their pedigree through the tricky sweeps. A 14.822 in the second sector. That is a full second quicker than Des in sector two. What a run. 41.159. Yeah, look, this is different. I'm feeling quite uh, ill. I might vomit <laughs> right here. This adrenaline rush <laughs> up and down, up and down is too much for me. I prefer good old normal racing. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I'm just so happy. I'm thanks to my guys, uh, Kubis and, and, and Eddie and... Uh, and Johan, for, as always, putting a beautiful car together and uh, we just, I don't know, we got it together in that last lap and just uh, it all happened. Every corner came together. Sadly, the hill climb was missing from the motorsport calendar last year. Jaguar brought it back in 2014. And all I can say is, wow, what an incredible event. The weather played its part. The competitors were really pushing the edge. And a new hill climb record was set by Franco Scribanti. Will it be back big and better next year? Oh, you betcha.